All right, well, welcome to class number eight. We have uh, two more after this, and we are going to try to finish up. At the rate we're going, we will not make it, but we shall hurry. We're taking our questions and answers, frequently asked questions, things that come up in our seminar. Uh, people say, well, if the dinosaurs lived only a few thousand years ago, or some are still alive, do we ever find any fresh dinosaur bones that are not fossilized? Uh, yes, some have been found. If you get the book, The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure by Buddy Davis, who works uh, some with Ken Ham up in uh, Cincinnati area, uh, great, great ministry there called Answers in Genesis. He's got a book called The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure. On page 87, it tells about them when they went to Alaska and found uh, dinosaur bones that were frozen back into the, in, digging back into the bank of the um, riverbed. Now, Journal of Science, November 24th, December 24th, 93, Report the amazing preservation of the bones of a young duckbill dinosaur found in Montana. Under a microscope, the fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent that cell characteristics could be compared with cells of chicken bone. Very well preserved. In Alaska, 1961, a geologist found a bed of dinosaur bones in unfossilized condition. Not fossilized. They cannot possibly be millions of years old. A uh, young Inuit, as a Canadian Eskimo, Working with scientists from Newfoundland's Memorial University in 1987 on Violet Island, found part of a lower jaw of a duckbill dinosaur. It too was in fresh condition. This uh, article in uh, Time Magazine for Kids on page uh, 7 of April 27th, year 2000, shows the kids that they found a dinosaur fossil, fossilized dinosaur with a fossilized heart in it. Now, there has since been some real controversy about this, of whether that's even a heart or not. One of their arguments was, yes, it's a heart, and yes, it's a four-chambered heart. Well, now, hold on a minute. We're not even positive it's a heart, okay? Very rare for soft tissue to fossilize. It can happen, but it's very rare for that to happen. I'm not saying it's not a heart. I just don't think it's been demonstrated conclusively that it was, except to those who really want to believe that dinosaurs turn to birds. Since birds have four parts to their heart, almost all reptiles have three, three-chambered heart. We talked about that before. The blood circulation through the lungs and everything is totally different in those types of animals. How it could possibly survive a transition from three to four, nobody's ever demonstrated that. It's just pure theoretical. Okay, here's a good question I got one time. If there really was a flood, where are all the human bones? Good question. All right, here's my answer to that one. Marvin Lubinow, who wrote the book uh, Bones of Contention, excellent book, by the way, we have it in our bookstore. He said there have been about 4,000 human remains found. <clears throat> Some are very, very fragmentary, just a few small pieces. Some very complete skeletons. Trillions of fish fossils are found. Probably billions of plant fossils are found. And yet only about 4,000 human fossils. Why? Well, when God created the world 6,000 years ago, it was full of uh, plants and full of animals, but only two people. God didn't make two chickens. He made a world full of animals, which would include probably millions of chickens and millions of cows. and All the animals were made, but only two people were made. So when Adam and Eve are standing there in the garden, it's full of trees and full of animals, but they're the only two people. Okay. 1,600 years later, we have a big flood. Kills everybody. Drowns everything. The world is still full of plants and animals, but still not full of people. Population grew to no, who knows what. Okay, this is my chart, just guessing. There may have been a billion people. It might have been lots less. It might have been lots more. There's absolutely no way to tell that I can figure out. They probably had huge families, 100 or 200 children per family. No reason not to when you have infinite food supply and you got the whole world. You know, matter of fact, it would be an advantage to have a huge family to help you know, do the chores. But uh, before... The time, the life, lifespans before the flood were over 900 years, and during this time probably had huge families and maybe a population of a billion, I don't know. But the purpose of the flood was to destroy man from off the earth. It says so in Genesis chapter 6. God said, I will destroy man. The Bible also says there were giants in the earth back in those days. Well, let's just consider this as a possibility. Suppose people, suppose Adam and Eve were 12 feet tall. Suppose everybody was 12 feet tall back then, Okay. If we dig up the bones today, a fragment of a bone from somebody 12 feet tall, people who ha already have the evolution mindset already think that man started off small and he's getting bigger. Therefore, whatever this is, it can't be a giant human because we know man used to be smaller like a chimpanzee. So that's going to hinder their 
their research. Giant bones have been found of humans, like the one uh, the government of Turkey claims is from the grave of Noah. They think they found Noah's grave. He was about 12 feet tall, according to the officials over there in this town. Here's, here's my reasons why I think so few, few hum, human fossils have been found. Number one, there were less people to be killed than there were animals. Number two, people are smarter than animals, that is, some people, and would tend to avoid drowning until last, and so therefore they end up on top to rot instead of getting buried to fossilize. Question, how many buffalo were killed in the uh, prairies over the last 200 years? Millions. Remember they tried to starve out the Indians by killing off the buffalo? Go find me one fossilized buffalo. You won't find any fossilized buffalo. Why not? Left on, Left on top. They didn't get buried. The only way an animal can fossilize, it has to be buried quickly in mud so that the bones can be preserved and the buffalo were not buried quickly in mud. All fossils are testimony to a rapid burial, probably the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. Number three, if humans were bigger, the bones may not be recognized as human due to the preconceived evolution worldview. I was in a debate with a, a former preacher turned atheist. It's debate number seven of my series. And he said, where did Noah get the pitch to make the, uh, get the oil to make the pitch to coat the ark so it wouldn't uh, leak? He said, oil is made from uh, things that drowned in the flood, according to creationists, and so Noah can't get any pitch because Noah built the ark before the flood and there wasn't any oil. In well, the first place, oil is made from all sorts of things. Okay, You can get oil from many, many sources. Um, God told Noah in Genesis chapter 6, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in it, and pitch it within and without with pitch. In Exodus chapter 2, uh, Pharaoh or Moses' sister and mother used pitch to daub the ark, so it would, the little bitty ark that Moses would put in so it wouldn't leak. In Isaiah 34, it talks about the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, burning pitch. It shall not be quenched day nor night. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. Hmm. Pitch, according to an old dictionary, is a thick, tenacious substance, the juice of a species of pine or fir, called whatever it is in Latin there. So pitch is made from the juice of a pine tree. Pitch is not made from oil. There were whole factories producing pitch just for the ship industries for hundreds of years before there ever was a commercial oil industry. Does anybody know when the first commercial oil well was drilled, or where it was drilled? <coughs> Pennsylvania, I think, 1828. First oil well. Well, they had wooden ships a long time before that, didn't they? How did they waterproof them? With pitch. There were giant factories that all they would do is produce pitch to sell it, produce it from pine trees. Today, you take pine sap, you can boil it and get all sorts of different things. I mean, it's amazing the things can be made from the sap from different kinds of pine trees. Turpentine and stuff like that from, from pine. This is from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Talks about the uh, pitch. He says, definition number two, the resin of pine or turpentine in, in inspissated, I forgot how to pronounce that word, I can't believe it. Anyway, it's used in caulking ships and paying the sides and bottom. So they had it back in 1828, same year the first commercial oil well was drilled. I believe I'm correct on that. Okay, people say, was ancient man primitive? I don't think so. We've got a great book that we sell called The Puzzle of Ancient Man by Don Chittick, who's a creation uh, speaker. There's his phone number right there if you want to call uh, Don. He's put this together, a tremendous book of evidence of uh, really advanced civilization, like this uh, little airplane found in a South American grave, probably about a thousand years old, Smithsonian has it, and they have it labeled as a stylized insect. It doesn't look like a stylized insect. It looks like an airplane to me. This uh, book, uh, Feats and Wisdom of the Ancients, uh, Time Life magazine, uh, page 19, shows an airplane found in a grave probably from about 2,100 years ago in an Egyptian tomb. This iron pot found in coal. No, ancient man was not primitive. There are some giant stone blocks 20,000 tons. The biggest crane on earth today can only lift 3,000 tons. This uh, bell found inside a lump of coal. Ancient man was not primitive. They made all sorts of interesting artifacts a long time ago. A calculator, a computing device, an analog computer, found on board a ship that sank about 100 BC. Interesting. 
How did they, did they know about analog computing 2,000 years ago? The iron uh, hammer found that uh, Carl Ball has in his museum, found in Texas, is very unusual metallurgy. They can't even make that today. The, uh, this, in Baghdad, Iraq, this battery was found in a city supposed to be 2,000 years old when they're digging it up. They knew about electricity a long time ago. World Explorer magazine has great articles. Uh, they're not Christian magazine by any means, but uh, great articles about ancient people using electricity to light uh, cities that they would build in caves and things like that. There's no smoke on the ceilings, and yet they did incredible artwork in there. They did uh, brain surgery. Some skulls are found where they did brain surgery and the people healed, the whole healed over. This metallic sphere was found in South Africa. Three parallel grooves going around the equator of the sphere. The problem is it was in Precambrian mineral, supposed to be 2.8 billion years old. Man didn't get here until about one or two million, million years ago. This is 2.8 billion. They found all sorts of these spheres in Africa. The article says South Africaners African miners have found hundreds of metallic spheres, at least one of which has three parallel grooves running around the equator. And there's all sorts of information about this. Uh, they said it cannot be scratched even by steel. Very hard. Mohs hardness scale named after Frederick Mohs, who chose ten minerals as reference. One for diamond. Uh, well, I'm sorry, talc is the softest at one. Diamond is the hardest at ten. Um, and here these spheres are extremely hard, a kind of iron. Anyway, you can read all the article about that from Michael Cremo's book. Um, oh, let's see. I think it mentions it here. Um, if I recall, it's been about a year since I read the book. Well, Michael Cremo is a Hindu, and he's got a great book called The Hidden History of the Human Race. It's in my library there. But he shows all sorts of evidence that ancient man had incredible knowledge, you know, things, metallurgy, stuff like that. And then, but, he, but he does believe the evolution teaching. So when they say this is pre-Cambrian, he says, yep, this really is 2.8 billion years old. He believes that part of it, okay? That's where his mistake is. And then he'll say, see, this proves aliens visited the planet 2.8 billion years ago. That's the only way he can answer it. He wants to hang on to the dumb geologic column and do intelligent research and try to blend the two together. If you get rid of the geologic column, it would be the albatross you could cut off from around your neck, and it would help you a lot in your research. Uh, let's see. All about that thing. This uh, mortar and pestle and a lot of uh, very interesting tools were found in California gold mines. This is called the Coastal Artifact, found in 1961 in California, 4,300 feet above sea level. It's 340 feet above the dry Owens Lake, six miles north of Alancha, California. It looked like a geode, a small rock. When they cut it open, it appeared to look like a spark plug, porcelain inside, and a metallic wire down the middle, I believe. Here's some uh, imaging of it. I don't know if it's x-ray imaging or whatever, but you can get the website members.nbci.com slash logo 72 slash harbinger 11 htm and uh, get information about this. Geologists think it's about a thousand years old. Owens Lake was as high as the top of that at, of that peak. A thousand years ago, Owens Lake was that high. Currently, no professional scientist has ever investigated the artifact. Even though it is found to be magnetic, it's quite similar technologically to a modern-day ceramic superconductor compa capacitor. Very interesting. These little... Uh, Spirals, it's called nanotechnology. These are extremely tiny. These are found all over Russia. Where is this, uh, brother, you're from Russia. Uh, present report, Central Scientific Research Institute for Geology and Prospecting in Moscow. You've been to Moscow, right? Z-N-I-G-R-I, -I, probably the uh, Russian initials for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they've done studies on these things. Since 1991, more and more spiral-shaped objects have been found on the banks of the rivers Narada, Kozum, and whatever the other one is, in eastern Ural Mountains. To date, these inexplicable artifacts have been found in their thousands at various sites near the rivers, and also by two smaller streams named, how would you pronounce that? V-T-V-I-S-T-Y. 
Uh, about a little past halfway down. Two rivers. Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mostly at depths between 3 and 12 meters, 10 and 40 feet. The size of these things range from a maximum of 1.5 inch, 1.2 inches, down to an incredible 0 0.003 millimeters, 1 ten thousandth of an inch. Exact measurements of these microscopically small objects have shown that the dimensions of the spirals are in the so-called golden mean ratio. Now the golden mean ratio, Jessica, make a note for me to get some more pictures of the golden mean ratio in here, because Walt Disney did a f video years ago with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, I think it was in the golden mean ratio. It was incredible, showing how musical notes follow this ratio. If you take one number, well, there's several different patterns in, in mathematics that are fascinating, that are found all over in nature. But uh, the Greeks knew about this golden mean ratio. They always made the height of their windows 1.6 more than the width. Take the width times 1.6, 1.61, it's a long number, but roughly 1.6. Um, and it's very pleasing aesthetically to the eye. Even the Parthenon, if you look at the Parthenon, the height and width are this golden mean ratio. The distance between all the pillars and the height of the pillars is the golden mean ratio. You see it all through the Parthenon, just the way it's designed. And they've discovered it's very pleasing to the eye to see this, this particular ratio, okay? You can study more on that. There's lots of stuff. I'll just flash it up on the screen here quickly. This molybdenum, which is what is, is in a tungsten used in these uh, little extremely tiny spirals, uh, has a melting point of 4,740 degrees Fahrenheit. How did these people make these things? I suspect pre-flood man was not only much smarter, but had much better eyesight than we have probably would not need magnifying glass to see some really tiny things. Just much better eyesight. That's just my theory. I think you'll find all sorts of ancient artifacts that are, and ancient writings and artwork that is best explained by people having much better eyesight and much better night vision, being able to see in much darker places so they can do paintings and cave walls without, without lights. Okay. Get the website members.nbci.com slash logo 72 and you can get more on these little artifacts, if you want uh, more on that. This is from May 19th of 99. Okay, what about the Great Pyramid? I'm going to breeze over this quickly. I've covered everything I know about it on Seminar Part 7. <clears throat> I don't have a positive answer to this. There are a couple theories about the Great Pyramid. There are 67 pyramids. All of them, 66 of them, are copies of the Great Pyramid. Very amazing structure. All the rest of them are very inferior compared to the Great Pyramid. And all the rest of them are loaded with, you know, hieroglyphics. This is for King Herman. He's the greatest guy that ever lived, etc., etc. The Great Pyramid has none of that. There are some people who think the Great Pyramid was built by godly people to be a testimony to the Lord. Other people think, no, it's the Pyramid of Cheops or Cheops, however you pronounce his name, and it's just a heathen king. Well, why there are no inscriptions in it, nobody's been able to answer, okay? It may just be an Egyptian building, or it might be that somebody built this to be a testimony to the Lord. All I do is present the theory as an option, okay? It says in Isaiah chapter 19, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. There's a preacher in Georgia, uh, I forgot his name right now, he's uh, almost 80 years old, travels around and speaks a lot on the Great Pyramid, not Vail. I'll think of it too late. Anyway. He has great sermon. He's preached many, many times on the Great Pyramid. He studied it carefully, and he says, Egypt used to be two kingdoms, and the pyramid is right on the border between the two kingdoms, but once they join together, it's now in the midst. He said, this is the only structure that's both in the midst and at the border, like the prophecy said. He th said, this prophecy is about the Great Pyramid, according to this preacher in Atlanta area. I'll think of his name. Okay. The Great Pyramid is a very unusual building. It is by far the largest building in the world. This is building number one when it comes to volume. If you got all the buildings in the world and put them in order of volume, biggest to smallest, Great Pyramid is number one. Then you take building number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way to 100. The next 99 buildings in a row put together would not equal the size of this one. It is 
480 feet tall, I think. The base is 13 acres. Absolutely monstrous building. About 480, I think. There, are, there have been many, many books written on this pyramid. What's that? It's about 27 stories. Yeah, 27, 28 stories. No, 480 feet, 48, 48 stories. Figure 10 feet per story, roughly. Yeah. 48 stories. Um, big building. Some of the stones in there weigh 70 tons. How you lift a 70 ton stone 400 feet off the ground, I don't know. If you notice this schematic of the Great Pyramid, you can walk in at the far right there, letter A, that's the door. The doorway was not even discovered until about the year 800. Grave robbers had gone in and opened up the other pyramids and stolen all the jewels out of all of them. But nobody could ever figure out how to get into this one. Even the oldest Egyptian records say, yep, there's a big pyramid out there and we don't know who built it. The sides of it were covered with smooth, polished casing stones. They fit together. They're 10 feet thick, these stones. That's 10 feet thick. Polished, so smooth, sometimes you couldn't even find the seams. You, could, you couldn't get a piece of paper between the seams. They fit together just that flawlessly. Just And it shined at noon. Of course, the light would shine off this thing and just glow like a big diamond sitting out there in the desert. And it might not have been a desert at the time it was built. Okay, We don't know. Eight, about 820-something, I forget the year, some guy decided he was going to hire some local people, and they're going to, they can't find the door to get in the pyramid, so they're going to chip a hole in the side and just keep drilling until they find a passageway inside. So they're working on this for weeks and weeks, you know, chiseling in this boiling hot uh, conditions, and inside a rock cave, you make it even hotter. Guys are miserable, they haven't found any gold yet, so they're digging and digging and digging. They're about to give up, and one of the guys heard of something fall. He heard a hollow spot. So they chiseled that direction, found the channel, I think it was pathway number B going down, letter B there, and went into the pathway and found out that it was blocked by a big granite plug. So they had to chisel their way through the granite plug, had to work more weeks to cut their way through this thing. It's a long story how these guys did this. Finally, he knew the next morning, the, the guy in charge of this crew, they've been working for months now, knew we're going to get into the chamber tomorrow. And there better be some gold in there or these guys are going to kill me. So he went ahead, I think, if I have the story right, one night, broke through the final wall, went into the king's chamber, found nothing, and so he took some gold in there himself so the guys could find it the next day so they wouldn't kill him. That's rough version of the story as I remember. Anyway, if you go in the doorway to the Great Pyramid, you can go down to a place called the Pit, letter C. The broad way leads down to the Pit. Or you can take the narrow way to the king's chamber the broad way and the narrow way. Now that'll preach. Okay. As you go up into the king's chamber, you enter what's called the Grand Gallery. I'm going uh, this next spring to tour the Great Pyramid, Lord willing. I'm going on a cruise, 10-day cruise. If you want to come along, you're welcome to come. It's like 2500 bucks or something. Get on our website and click on Cruise. It's a 10-day cruise to Egypt, to Israel, to Greece, to Turkey, Patmos, all the cities you know mentioned, a lot of cities mentioned in the Bible. A cruise ship, going to go around and see all those things, which I've never seen. The government, will fund you. the government will fund you. Tell the Marines you want to raise or something, right? Great Pyramid is very interesting. It was originally covered by 144,000 casing stones. That's an interesting number. The chief cornerstone, the very top of the building, was never put in place. Giant building, the top stone was never installed. One rock short of finishing. Why? Nobody knows. Okay, It is 90 times the volume of the Sears Tower. Absolutely massive <coughs> building. <coughs> there are many who go around preaching, and I don't know if they're right or not. I, I, don't, I don't know. They say that the pyramid inch is the symbol to interpret this thing, and you can measure up this grand gallery, and there are marks along the wall from major world events. World War I's on there. World War II's on there. And they say it's all symbolic of the whole future, and God apparently gave all this revelation to whoever built it. Some have argued it was Adam. Some have argued it was Noah, who built it after the flood. He did live a long time after the flood. You know, what did he do? I don't know. Some argued that it was Enoch before the flood, and that because it was sealed, it survived the flood. 
I don't know, okay? Hank Hanegraaff has blasted me three times on his program for even mentioning the Great Pyramid. He thinks it's nothing but a big, you know, Egyptian building. And so, Hank, you can believe whatever you want. He says, Hovind teaches pyramidology. I do not teach pyramidology. I don't know. I think it's an interesting study. If you want to study it, enjoy yourself, okay? <laughs> I've read many books on it, and it, yeah, I don't know the answer. But the Bible says in Revelation, there are going to be 144,000 Jews get saved during the tribulation. Very interesting. Okay. Inside the Great Pyramid, you will find the King's Chamber. There's an empty tomb in there, which I've been told is the same volume as the Ark of the Covenant. No body or evidence of any body has ever been found in there. Empty tomb. The top stone was never installed. Very interesting symbolism here, if it is indeed something to be a testimony to be the Bible in stone, for instance. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the head of the corner. Those people who believe in pyramidology have said, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the stone the builders rejected. By the way, the cornerstone on the pyramid would have five sides, which is the number of grace. And the cornerstone for a building like that is 100% in the way until the building is done. You can't set anything on it. You can't use it as a work table. I mean, it comes to one point. Where do you park it? It's nothing but in the way. Nobody wants it around until the building's done, and then it's time to put the cornerstone. Just like the world today, is Jesus, is, Jesus is in their way. Okay, But if he is the chief cornerstone, if his symbolism goes to the pyramid, then he will come back and finish the job. It's also very interesting that the... Uh, the book of Daniel talks about the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, smote the image on the feet, and made the, uh, grew, into be, grew to be a great mountain. Uh, Noah Hutchings has a good book on the Great Pyramid. If you want more on that, I recommend you read this book from Southwest Radio Church. And if you get on my seminar notebook, which you should have, the pages with all the recommended reading, there's a whole section on the Great Pyramid. Some of the books written there are written by Jehovah's Witnesses. They've studied the Great Pyramid a lot. They think it's all... Got a lot of good symbolism in it. Uh, Mormons have spent some time st working on this. So I can't vouch for anybody's doctrine. I'm just saying it's an interesting study. Read it for yourself. The occult symbol on the back of our dollar bill shows uh, the Great Pyramid. Behind the pyramid, you see there is nothing representing the world before the New World Order, where it's just desert. And on the front of the pyramid, there are some things growing, representing they're going to bring life into the world. This is the New World Order idiots who think they're going to control the world. I've been told the eye on top is supposed to represent uh, uh, Lucifer, the light bearer. It is the right eye of a person. All this is supposed to be symbolic of, of something. Study it for yourself, see what you think. Okay, a couple more questions here and we'll take a break. <clears throat> was the earth ever hot molten mass? No. Textbooks teach the earth formed and it was hot like the moon. That is absolutely scientifically impossible. The Bible says God created the earth under water. Here we have a clear conflict. Somebody's wrong. Textbook says the earth started off hot and cooled down. God said it started off cool. Never was a hot molten mass. So, how do you tell who's right? Well, Robert Gentry uh, has a website, halos.com. Excellent material on radioponium halos, which we cover on video number seven of our series in about as much detail as I know. I can't add much to that. But these little polonium halos are um, found in granite rocks all over the world. I went to meet with Robert Gentry, um, 99, I believe, or oh, year 2000, M May, March of 2000. I went to, down into his laboratory and saw the radio polonium halos for myself through his microscope. Very interesting. These little polonium halos, polonium is a radioactive element, like uranium, potassium, uh, and it blows up like a hand grenade. Fragments fly off. But they fly a certain distance. It's like if you exploded a hand grenade underwater, fragments would fly a certain distance, and then they would all fall to the bottom of the pond or lake. When they shoot fireworks, 4th of July, it goes up, shh, boom. The fragments fly out, makes a sphere. Everybody goes, wow, yay, and then they all fall down, right? Suppose I said, Jeff, I want you to launch some fireworks, explode a sphere, and freeze the sphere in place. That'd be tough to do, right? These little polonium atoms are breaking down, radio uh, 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 metric decay, and the fragments fly out into the granite, a certain distance. I mean, we're talking microscopic, okay? It makes a little ring, a sphere. If the rock were hot, the sphere would, and then decay, be gone. 
like they can't hold it in the atmosphere of water because it's liquid. Molten rock would not hold these spheres. Polonium halos are proof positive the Earth was never a hot molten mass. And you can get Robert Gentry's book or get on halos.com if you want more information on that. Okay, what about global warming? How many of you have heard the Earth is warming up and we need more government regulations? Of course, you know, bigger government will fix the problem. You're right. Show me any problem bigger government has fixed other than more jobs for the, uh, those who can't get a regular job. Um, there's a good book on this topic. Uh, I don't sell the book. Uh, Derry Brownfield did not write it, but Derry Brownfield's a friend of mine in uh, Centralia, Missouri, I believe is the name of the city. Uh, tremendous guy, great radio host, has a radio program, Common Sense for America or something like that. Common Sense Coalition, that's it. Here's his phone number. Call Derry and get this book, Facts Not Fear. Marilyn Quayle is one of the people who's endorsed this book and written a forward to it. This goes all about, teaches all about the environment and what they really, what's really going on. The people that are most worried about global warming are the ones that live near the beach. Because if the earth warmed up, the ice caps would melt back, raising the ocean. If the earth warmed up a couple of degrees and some, of the, some more ice melted at the North Pole and South Pole, and the oceans came up 50 feet, that'd be great. I'm 60 feet above sea level right here. I'd have beachfront property. <laughs> That's basically what would happen. Uh, and they're using the environmental movement to bring in Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, plank number one, abolish private property. The environmental movement is really a smokescreen to cover the advance of communism. They want to control your property. We covered on the, some of that later or earlier on one of our previous series. Okay, Green River Formation. You will certainly get this if you get into a debate on evolution. I get this just about every week. They'll say, we know the Earth is millions of years old because of the Green River Formation. You say, what on Earth is that? Well, there's a place in uh, Wyoming and Montana, I believe it's mostly Wyoming, if I recall, called the Green River Formation. It's a layer of rock, okay? But this rock, this, this strata, has millions of very thin lines. And they analyze these lines and say, you know what, this is different kinds of pollen in these uh, lines. Some of this pollen is only produced in the spring and some is only produced in the fall. So each line represents spring and fall, spring and fall, spring and fall. So these become annual rings. And since there are millions of them, that proves the Earth is millions of years old. That's the way the logic goes. Same thing with the ice rings. Remember that? We covered the ice rings in, in, uh, in Greenland. Okay. Well, as they dig down through the Green River Formation, they found layers of ash. A volcano blew up, <laughs> spread a layer of ash everywhere. That's called an event horizon. We covered that last week, I believe. You dig down a little further, <clears throat> you find another event horizon. Volcano blew up another time, left a layer of ash behind. In between those ash layers, there are layers of this rock. Thousands and thousands of little thin lines. And they'll say, see, each one is a year. So this took, you know, millions of years to form the Green River Formation. <clears throat> if you get those things at the store that have two pieces of glass with a different colored sand and you flip it over, you know, and it always makes the little lines down there. How many have seen those before? The Green River Formation has millions of these lines, no question. But that doesn't prove it took millions of years. You can take a rock from Green River Formation, grind it up to powder, and pour it back into moving water. It'll separate again into thousands of little layers. All those layers form quickly in one big flood in the days of Noah. Creation Magazine had an article about that some time ago that was really excellent on Green River Formation. Paul Gardner, um, a geologist in uh, European uh, creation geological circles, had written an article about it. He said between two different ash layers, event horizons, the number of layers varies by as much as 35%. So it, they can't be annual rings. This is proof positive of that. How many have heard about man finding life of evidence of life on Mars? You ever heard about that? From the Mars rock. Yeah. Well, let's tell you what they found, and we'll take our break here. This uh, article in the newspaper said, Are we really Martians? Astronomers say life here could have come from Mars. Can you believe they cut down a tree to make a newspaper to print this junk? They killed a tree to say that. <laughs> Come on. 
This guy is insane, okay? Anybody who wants to believe that is welcome to believe it, I, I suppose, but that's not common sense. That's not science. Here's the story. The Mars lander sampled Martian soil. Sophisticated tests performed on the samples did not even find a trace of a germ. No evidence of any life on Mars. Here's the rock that the big deal was about. This rock, uh, ALH 84001,0, is in uh, storage, I'm sure, behind a locked vault where nobody can touch this thing. When they looked at the rock under the microscope, they found this little wiggly line. See that line coming across the center of the screen right there like a worm? They said, there it is, folks. Proof there was life on Mars. Now, let's stop and think about this. They find this rock in Antarctica near the South Pole. They find a line on it. They say, this proves there's life on Mars. Anybody see a problem with the th steps of log logic here? <laughs> Here's what really happened, okay? Mars is a long ways from the Earth. The closest it ever gets is 0.5 astronomical units. That's about 46 million miles. That's the closest it ever gets. You think something hit Mars hard enough to knock a piece off so it could fly over to Earth, land on the Earth, and still show evidence of bacteria on this rock. Don't you think getting hit hard enough to be blasted off that far would uh, heat the rock and destroy any evidence of any bacteria? Don't you think re-entry into Earth's atmosphere would heat it up and destroy any evidence of bacteria? Don't you think sitting there in Antarctica for thousands of years would give it a chance of getting contaminated with bacteria? What really happened is, they claim it came from Mars. There's no proof of that. They claim it broke off 16 million years ago and landed 13,000 years ago. I'd like to know what the bacteria ate for all that time. How did it survive the impact, the vacuum of space, the entry, the freezing for 13,000 years? NASA did the research. It's very interesting. At the same time they did this research, the NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. Congress was not going to vote to spend the billions of dollars for NASA. NASA scientists said, by the way, we have to find something, you know, we've got to find something to make us worthwhile. That rock had been sitting in a closet for seven years. They had the rock from a long time ago. They draw, drew the rock out and said, wow, look at this. We found evidence of life on Mars. You better get our money out of Congress. We can keep studying this. As soon as the grant money was released, and it was shortly thereafter, they said, oops, it's not really a bacteria. It's actually a uh, carbonate crystal. It's a natural formation. No life on Mars. Sorry, we'll keep looking. Well, what about giving back our grant money? Oh, no, we've got to keep that now because we've got to keep looking. So all this was was a hoax to support the evolution theory and to get their grant money through Congress. All right? The Bible says Eve is the mother of all living, so I don't think there's life on other planets. There might be, but I doubt it. Nobody's proven any at all. Okay, come back from the break. We're talking about theistic evolution. Is that a reasonable alternative? Coming up next. Let's talk about theistic evolution. A theist is a person who believes in God. So, theistic evolution would be the idea that maybe God made the world using evolution to do it. These are the people who try to put the two together. They want to believe in evolution, but they want to believe God did it that way. Well, numerous problems with theistic evolution. Don Boys, a friend of mine in Chattanooga, Ringgold, George, actually, he said, theistic evolution is like trying to ride two horses in the, at the same time when the horses are going in opposite directions. Can't do it. Hugh Ross, of course, is one of the most famous, he would cl claim he is not a theistic evolutionist, but he does believe an awful lot of the tenets of evolution. And I've got material on that. Okay. Why do some people believe this? I don't know how anybody can say the Bible teaches theistic evolution. Couldn't God have used evolution to make the universe? Uh, no. Unless that depends on what you mean by God. If you mean the God of the Bible, absolutely not. If you mean, if you have a different God, well then certainly your God can, you can believe any kind of God you want. 
Number one, I would say, it's not the clear teaching of the Bible. If you just read the Bible, you will never put evolution into that. Jacques Menard, a Nobel Prize winner, said, he was commenting on theistic, theistic evolution. He stated, Natural selection is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species, and more and more complex and refined organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process, against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society, where one where the weak is protected. That is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. Here's an evolutionist who says, why do some people believe God would use this cruel process? Evolution is cruel. Is that the way God did it? Philosopher David Hall, Northwestern University, said, whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, be, may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. If God used evolution, would you want to worship a God like that? The Bible says the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God created it. God made things perfect. He did it in six days, according to Exodus 20.11. It's real clear. He made it in six days, and he rested the seventh day. His works were finished after six days. It's not a continuing process of evolution. God finished it in six days. It's been falling apart since then because of the effects of man's sin, apparently. But in Hebrews uh, 4, it tells us uh, God rests the seventh day from all his works. So it's not a long, ongoing process. He ended his work, tells us in Genesis chapter 2. He's done. So no, it, the clear teaching of the Bible is not evolution. The Bible says death came into the world by sin. You know, why do we have death in the world? Because of man's sin. If, ev if theistic evolution is true, then death was already here before man even arrived. So now you have death before sin. Very serious problem. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, by man came death. In Adam all die. The reason we have death in the world is because of Adam's sin. Okay, and then we get into the gap theory. Not true, not scripture. We covered that on video number two. The Bible says God made man in his image. And he made Eve. He made Adam from the dust of the ground. He made Eve from a rib. He didn't have a long, slow process of slowly letting them come from an ape-like creature. I think a person who believes in theistic evolution has a retarded God that can't make it right first time. It's not the God of the Bible. Your God is stupid. You need to trade him in for a real God. Okay? God who can make it right. The Bible says God's work is perfect. Um, so, it's not the character of God to use misfits and death to accomplish his goals. God makes things perfect. Darwin's philosophy was... the way you get ahead is by war, nature, uh, war of nature, from famine, from death... He said, that's the most, from these things, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals, directly follows. Now, wait a minute. Is that how we get ahead from war, suffering, death, misfits, famine? No, Charlie. God made a perfect world, and man's sin messed it up. So theistic evolution would certainly nullify the need for the death of Christ, since Adam died and brought death into the world, sinned and brought death into the world, and Christ died to redeem us. You have a serious theological problem. There's no evidence of evolution anyway. So why should we compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory like evolution? See, the Bible's never been proven wrong in any way. Evolution's never been proven right in any way. Why some Christians are out there trying to blend the two absolutely blows my mind. Okay, next question. Didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yeah, several popes have accepted evolution. So what? I wouldn't believe anything the pope said anyway, okay? I've only been able to find this from one source. I've had several other people say, yes, they, they think it's true, but I haven't documented it yet, because history gets rewritten over the years. But here is what um, 
William Cooper said in his book, Behold a Pale Horse. Very fascinating story. He said, during World War II, a Polish salesman working for IG Farb and Chemical Company sold cyanide, Zyklon B, and Malthion to the Nazis to help exterminate the Jews at Auschwitz. After the war, he feared for his life, so he joined the Catholic priest and became Catholic Church and became a priest. 1946. 1958. He was ordained as Poland's youngest bishop. After 30 days, the reigning pope was assassinated, and he became Pope John Paul III. Very interesting story. Uh, I cannot document that it's true. The pope right now is apparently the former cyanide salesman that ran for his life from the Nazis. What better place to hide than in plain sight? The dragon on a large, this is a crest in the Vatican Museum that the Pope, you know, one of the symbols of the Pope. Vatus is from the word diviner. Can from serpent. Vatican means the divining serpent. The, the Catholic Church, and there's an awful lot of good people that are just duped by that religion. Catholicism is an evil, wicked philosophy that is not Christian. Okay? And they need to get out of that. They're wolf in sheep's clothing. My humble, unbiased opinion. Okay. Are there contradictions in the Bible? Well, let's discuss the question here. The um, Bible says the Word of God uh, is our sword. And the Bible says it's pure. Do we have any contradictions in the Bible? It depends which version of the Bible you're using. Okay? I think I can point out some very obvious contradictions in many versions, and I'll do that here in a moment. I've been unable to find any contradictions in the King James. If you think you know of one, please let me know, and I'll try to research it. Okay? I've not seen any. I get a lot of them sent to me, and I'm able to find an answer, or find somebody else who has an answer to just about to everyone so far. Here's the one that almost got me as a new Christian. I was just saved a few months, and a liberal Methodist church camp counselor told me, there were contradictions in the Bible, and he just about destroyed my faith. He showed me Genesis chapter 1, where it says, God made the trees on the third day. Turn to chapter 1, verse 20, and it says on day 5, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl. He said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day 3. He said, when did he make the birds? I said, day 5. He said, what did he make the birds out of? I said, he made them out of water. Let the waters bring forth the birds. Okay? Adam was made from dust. Eve is made from a rib. Birds are made from water. That's what it says here, okay? Day 6, starting in Genesis 1, 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, and cattle, etc., etc. Then in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. He said, Kent, two questions here. What did he make the animals out of? I said, well, it looks like he made the animals out of the earth, out of the ground. He said, okay. Did he make the animals before man or after man? I said, he made the animals first, and then he made man. The guy said, that's exactly right. Now turn to chapter 2, and I'll show you a contradiction. Every debate I've done where we get into the question of contradictions, this one comes up without fail. <laughs> chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward at Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. He said, wait a minute, stop right there. Here we got a contradiction. Chapter 1 has trees made first and then man. Chapter 2 has man made first and then trees. Contradiction. Turn, turn to chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. He said, Well, here we have two contradictions. Animals are being made after man in chapter 2. And the fowl are being made out of the ground, whereas in chapter 1, the fowl are made out of the water. He said, Contradiction. <coughs> Several contradictions. So, here's the supposed contradictions. Chapter 1 has the grass and trees made on day 3. Chapter 2 has the plants and grass made after man on day 6. Chapter 1 has the birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has the birds made out of the ground on day 6. 
Chapter 1 has animals made before man on day 6. Chapter 2 has the animals made after man on day 6. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book, but it has contradictions in it. You've heard that story before, right? Well, let's just see the, tr tr the truth to all this. Here's what I think happened. On day 3, God made the plants. On day 5, He made the birds out of the water. On day 6, He made animals. And then He made man. And then He made a garden. Then he put the man in the garden. And in the garden, he made the trees that were good for food. And he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. So while Adam is standing there in what's going to be the Garden of Eden, the rest of the world is already full of animals and already full of plants. God's going to do some more creating, still on day six, no contradiction with Exodus 20.11. God's going to make some more trees, just so Adam can see that God is the one who's doing it. And he's going to make some more animals, again, so Adam can see God did it, and so Adam can select a wife. So up out of the ground came giraffe. Adam said, giraffe. No thanks. Up came elephant. He said, elephant. No thanks. Nice animal, but I don't want to marry it. And so one by one, Adam named each of the animals and rejected them as a wife. And that's when the Lord said, Adam, you go to sleep, son. I got a surprise for you when you wake up. And so he took one small part and made the world's first loudspeaker. I mean, uh, made, <laughs> I'm sorry, made the first woman. So that's the, uh, that's the sequence of events. It is not a contradiction at all. It's interesting. What is the only thing in the world at this time that did not see God create anything? Eve. If Eve was the last thing made, she didn't see anything get made. Who did Satan go to to tempt? Eve. The Bible says she's the weaker vessel. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He knew full well what he was doing when he ate that banana or whatever it was, okay? I don't know if it was an apple. Somebody said, did Adam and Eve have a date? Uh, probably an apple, we don't know. But the... the Eve was the one who didn't get to see anything created. She was deceived. Adam knew full well, if I don't take this thing, God's going to judge her. And I love my wife, so I'm going to become sin for her, just like Christ became sin for us to save us. Great sim symbolism there. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 4 tells us Solomon made a molten sea, big brass bowl, 10 cubits from brim to brim. That's 15 feet across. This is a big bowl. Okay. Five cubits high, about seven and a half feet high. And a line of 30 cubits did compass it about. I read that when I was a young Christian and thought, wait a minute, this is not right. If you find the circumference of a circle, you take the diameter times pi, which is 3.1415265. It goes forever. Nobody's ever found the end of it. Some Japanese guy figured it to 700 decimal places or something. Who cares, right? 3.14 is close enough for most calculations, but... Uh, the diameter times pi should give you 31 and a half cubits around, roughly. But even that would be an average. So, if the circle was 10 cubits across, it would be mathematically incorrect to say it's 30 cubits around. And yet in Second Chronicles it says the molten sea was 10 cubits from brim to brim and 30 cubits around. So is this a contradiction? Uh, no. If you keep reading the story, you find out the thickness of it was in hand breadth. It's a lot of brass. It's a big bowl. It's real thick. Okay. Here's my theory. The 10 cubits is outside to outside. The 30 cubits around is the inside circumference. You need the outside diameter to get, to get the thing through a doorway, but you don't care how thick the brass is when it comes to figuring the volume of water or whatever you're going to put in it. You would need the inside circumference. And so I did a study as a young Christian. I, took, I was studying math and science and always interested in the topic. So I would ask everybody, hey, let me measure your cubit. You know, put their elbow on the table, measure the height of their cubit, measure their hand breadth. And I figured, right in, make a note for me to put the formula on here to calculate backwards. It's found in the seminar notebook uh, to put the, on uh, slide number 316. Um, 
If you subtract two handbreadths and calculate backwards, you'll get a value of pi 3.14, 159. Try it sometime. Take 10 of your cubits, mine's 21 inches. Okay? I'll get the formula up there. And you can figure backwards and find your handbreadth, two handbreadths. So it's not a contradiction at all. Okay, if you have your Bibles, check this one out. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. How many horses did Solomon have for his chariots, anyway? Skeptics will say, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Even Henry Morris, in his Defender's Bible, says there's a copyist error right here. He won't say it's a contradiction. He says it's a copyist error. I disagree, Henry, and I told him so. He's a great man. I still sell his Bible and highly recommend it. However, we, sell, we put a little disclaimer with ours, the ones that we sell, saying, sorry, he's got a few mistakes in there. 1 Kings chapter 4 says so Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. When you look at the same story in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, it says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, now did he have 40,000 or did he have 4,000? Is this a contradiction in the Bible? 1 Kings 4, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. 2 Chronicles 9, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, they both agree there were 12,000 horsemen. There's no question from reading the whole chapter, this is two authors t telling the same story. Why the difference? Well, it's not a contradiction at all. It's exactly correct. And it's teaching us some very interesting things about Roman and uh, ancient Israeli warfare. Verse, the verse on top, 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does that verse tell me how many chariots he had? No. That tells me how many horses he had for his chariots, right? Look at Second Chronicles. Solomon had 4,000 stalls, four horses, and chariots. See that word and in there? This one tells me how many chariots he had, doesn't it? If he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, and 40,000 stalls for horses, for the chariots, well, guess what? He had 10 horses per chariot, didn't he? That's common sense in case you get a flat tire, you know. The horses get shot as much as the people do. I mean, those arrows are flying like mad over there. So, no, it's not a contradiction at all. For 2 Samuel, chapter 10. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles. But the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Do we have a contradiction here? Second Samuel says David slew the men of 700 chariots. First Chronicles said he slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Some people say, well, it's, a, it's, it's just a copyist error because in the Hebrew, if you make a little dot over the number, it means thousand or something, you know, it adds another zero. Don't give me all that stuff, okay? I think God can preserve his word just fine in English so I can have a copy too. All right, I don't speak Hebrew or Greek. What's that? There's 10 men in each chariot. There's 10 men in each chariot. Not a big deal. If he slew the men of 700 chariots, how many men would he slay? 7,000 men, which fought in chariots. Right? See, the chariot's like the tank. You have to have extra crews waiting on the sidelines. Somebody gets wounded, bring them out, load a new guy in there, take off again. Hook up a new horse, take off again. Not a contradiction at all. Now, many new versions of the Bible have tried to fix what they thought was a contradiction, and they messed it up by trying to fix it. I'll show you. Here's the NIV. Solomon had 4,000 stalls, four chariot horses, and 12,000 horses. Wait a minute. It should have been horsemen, right? Second Chronicles says Solomon had 4,000 stalls, four horses, and chariots. Well, if he had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses in the top one and 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, this 
This is simply not correct. It should be 10 horses per chariot. New American Standard got it right. 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots in the one, and 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. So they got it right. New Revised Standard Version got it wrong. They said Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Next one says he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horses. NIV got it wrong. And David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. First Chronicles says David killed 7,000 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. Now, if you were going to defend the NIV in a debate against an atheist, and he pointed out this contradiction, what could you possibly say? I'm sorry, you have a contradiction. <laughs> yeah, there, this is a contradiction. I don't, there's no way around this one. It's wrong. <laughs> New Revised Standard got part of it right and part of it wrong. David killed, of the Armenians, 700 chariot teams and 40,000 horsemen. Next one says David killed 7,000 Armenian charioteers, so that would be right, and 40,000 foot soldiers. Well, did he kill foot soldiers or horsemen? The 40,000, is they got the first part right and the second part wrong. Everybody's trying to help God out by fixing his word. Just leave it alone, it's doing fine. The book that we sell by Peter Ruckman uh, is an excellent book. It's, he's rude and crude and crass and all that stuff, you know, but it really is a good book. Uh, the Supposed Errors in the King James Bible. Uh, he defends over 500 of them and shows, you know, they are not heirs. And some have said, well, in Leviticus it says the coney, the rabbit, chews the cud, and rabbits don't chew the cud. So the Bible has a contradiction. Oh, come on now. Rabbits eat their food, digest it partially, expel it as waste, and then eat it again. Check it out with a book on rabbits. They do indeed re -go, go through their food one more time. So, yes, they do the effect of chew the cud. Okay. Isn't Eastern errors in Acts chapter 12, verse 4? Shouldn't Pascha be Passover? You can get any version of the Bible you want. Look up Acts 12, 4. It'll say... Passover. King James says Easter. The only one that says Easter. Let's read the story. Acts 12, verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because it saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had put, apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Almost all Bible critics will say, King James has a mistake right here, because nobody celebrated Easter for a few hundred years later. And there are 29 times where the word Pascha is used in the New Testament, or Pascha, whatever, Pascha, whatever it is, and it's always translated Passover. And that, that's correct. It's translated Passover in every case, except right here. They chose the word Easter. Is this a mistake? Well, let's just go look at the Passover. Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This shall be the first month of the year to you. This is April, okay? Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, April 10th, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, shall male of the first year, etc., etc. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. So the tenth day of April, they get the lamb. On the fourteenth day, they're going to kill it. Put the blood on the side posts and the top of the door. Which, by the way, is very interesting. If you go outside your house and put the blood on the top and then put the blood on the two side posts, you make a cross. Blood on the top, blood on the two side posts. 
interesting bit of trivia. That one's free. Okay. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. So, the first Passover was at night. Not an Easter sunrise service. Okay. It was at night. Not in the morning. Unleavened bread, bitter herbs, eat it raw. Uh, no, should not eat it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, etc., etc. Okay. It is the Lord's Passover. So the Bible tells us very clearly in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord's Passover was the 14th of April, first month. Verse 14, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall put away leaven out of your houses, for whosoever eateth leaven from the first day shall be cut off. And we can read all this passage here. So here in Exodus 12, it tells us, in verse 18, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, not a sunrise service, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty one and twentieth day of the month at even. So they celebrate the Passover, then seven days of eating unleavened bread. Anybody confused yet? Numbers tells us, And in the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. you got to get this now. Passover on the fourteenth, and then seven days of unleavened bread. Passover was at night, April fourteenth. Seven days of unleavened bread always followed the Passover. The pagan festival of Astar, or Ishtar, or Easter. Easter is a pagan festival. Was always held late in April to celebrate the earth regenerating itself after winter. The rebirth of the earth, because the crops are going to, things are going to start growing again. That's why they use rabbits, Playboy magazine, and eggs, Easter eggs, Easter bunny, it's all pagan holiday, pagan symbolism. Those are symbols of fertility. The feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread. Isn't that what it said back in Acts chapter 4? Then were the days of unleavened bread. So if Peter is arrested during the days of unleavened bread, Passover is already gone, isn't it? Herod wanted to kill him during his own pagan festival of Easter, which was coming up in a few days. King James is the only version to get it right. Check out all the other versions. They all say, Herod arrested him during the days of unleavened bread, intending after Passover to kill him. Oh, man, wrong. Sorry. Got a mistake. One atheist said, well, the Bible says in Genesis 10, that God divided the languages up, you know, Tower of Babel, Genesis 10. When you come to chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language. You should see it as a contradiction. I thought God divided the language, and here it says it's all one language. Well, duh. <laughs> this is so silly. <coughs> chapter 11 is going to go back and retell the story. Put it in capsulated form. It's like reading a newspaper. You pick up the headlines. Fifty people killed in bus crash. Wow. So you read the story. The bus was southbound on Main Street. Wait a minute. I thought 50 people were killed in a crash. How can the bus be southbound on Main Street? Well, duh, they're telling the details now, okay? <laughs> First they give you the headline, and now they go back to fill in the story. That's all it is between chapter 10 and chapter 11. How many died in the plague? In Numbers chapter 25, it says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. That's old English way of saying 24,000. When you read the same story in 1 Corinthians, it says, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day 3 and 20,000. Is there a contradiction here? Did 24,000 die in the plague, or did 23,000 die in the plague? Who's got an answer to that one? 23,000 died in one day. 
Does this tell us they all died in one day, in back in numbers? How many died in the plague? 24,000. 23,000 died one day. Guess what? 1,000 died the next day. <laughs> Not too complicated to figure out, is it? No, there are no contradictions at all. Okay. Uh, people, I get into the question of why do we use the King James versus other versions, and we can go for hours and hours on that. I won't take time to cover all that now. Um, I do cover that on my video number 7, Q&A, about the Texas Receptus versus the Alexandrian Manuscripts. There's a family of manuscripts. I'll just give you a brief synopsis here. When the Bible was first written, they're writing the Bible on this parchment or paper or whatever, and they roll it up in scroll form, though there were sometimes they used book forms even back then, uh, in sh shape of a book. Every morning they would unroll this scroll and make a copy, work on copying it, writing it out. You can only roll it and unroll it so many times, and pretty soon it gets brittle, and it begins to crack, and pretty soon it falls apart. After a few hundred years, it's trash. Uh, if I come to Jessica, one of our secretaries here, and I have a note. Here, Jessica, I want you to do this and do this and do this. Here's a list of things. You know, send this message to pastor in Oregon. You know, do this. I hand her this piece of paper. She takes the paper, types out my message, prints it out on letterhead, and sends it. What is she going to do with this paper? Throw it away. The message is what's important, not the paper it's written on, right? God told his prophets what to write. They wrote it down. Then people took and copied those writings. And after a few hundred years, they maybe had a few hundred copies. They would check these copies very carefully. If you find a mistake, you fix it or burn it, throw it away. Okay, no mistakes allowed. These guys were real careful in their copying system. The church gets persecuted, so they each take their copies and they spread out. Some go to Russia, some go to Germany, some go to Italy. You know, they spread out. The Christians spread out around the world. They're still busy copying their scrolls. <coughs> but now, these scrolls are not, have no contact with each other. The Russian ones are being copied and copied and copied, and the ones that, this is basically the Jews doing this, okay, or not the Jews, the Christians doing this in these countries. And every country has their own, most countries have their own set of these, these copies of the original. The original gets worn out, doesn't matter, burn it, we don't need it anymore, we've got 500 copies. So the original shot, who cares? These scrolls are separated from each other for hundreds of years. Meanwhile, about two or three hundred years after Christ, there's a bunch of folks down in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, make a note for me to put a map, uh, Jessica, right in here of Alexandria. Um, this is in northern Egypt. It used to be a major trade city, sort of like you know New York or Harvard University in Boston or something like that. Okay? This was the learning center of the world. A group of folks who wanted to claim to be Christians, but were really basically a cult, sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. They want everybody to think, oh, we're Christians like you are. No, you're not either, okay? You believe all kinds of weird stuff, and you're not a Christian. But they wanted to claim to be Christians, but they did not believe in the deity of Christ. They believed in all sorts of strange doctrines. So they made their own copy of the scrolls. As they're copying, they make a few changes. For instance, when the Bible says, Lord Jesus Christ, they just said Jesus in many instances. Now, if you're going to make a counterfeit $20 bill, you don't put Mickey Mouse's picture on it. Okay, you want to get as close as possible so nobody spots your counterfeit. So they, they made many changes, as many as they thought they dared, without people recognizing it you know, as an obvious fraud. Well, the New Testament church caught this and said, no, nah, this is baloney, this is a lousy manuscript, this is no good, we'll stick with our originals. So they're busy copying their originals, wearing them out. Meanwhile, the Alexandrian manuscript is, a few copies are made, 20 or 30, I don't know, and the cult eventually dies out. So the scrolls get stuck in a vase someplace, a jar, you know, and nobody uses them. They're copying and copying and copying and copying for hundreds of years, the Bible, wearing out the originals. After they're all worn out, you throw them away. Now you've got exact copies. They've all been checked, certified, verified, you know, tested, etc. You come to the year 1400, and somebody starts to gather together these different manuscripts from different countries and to get a collection of all the manuscripts, and he's going to put it in English. 
So we get the Tyndale Bible, the Wycliffe Bible, the King James Bible, all 1400, 1500, 1600 during this time frame. Everybody's happy. Wow, we got a great version of the Bible. You know, we've translated it. They found 5,000 copies of these, of the Bible. Sometimes the entire Bible, sometimes fragments. Couldn't find any differences between them except spelling changes. Sometimes Pedro and Peter, you know, same guy, obviously a different spelling. Okay. So they get these 5,000 manuscripts, compare them all, say, wow, look at this. They've been separated in these different countries for hundreds of years, copies after copies after copies, and they still say the same thing. Proof that God has preserved it. So they translate all this to English. Then along comes Westcott and Hort, two uh, perverts in the early 1800s, and they got the old Alexandrian manuscript and said, hey, this is older. And it was. Therefore, it's better. Right there's the mistake. Yes, it's older, but it's older because it's worse. Nobody wanted to use it. And so they translated this. They made their own Greek version of the New Testament based on the Alexandrian and made an English translation. And every one of the new modern translations is an English translation of the Alexandrian manuscript. There are many times verses are left out. Um, the great book, uh, New Age Bible Versions, you can get it from avpublications.com, which actually shows you the comparison of all the different versions. Here's King James, here's New American Standard, etc., etc. I've got 30 or 40 translations in my office there. Now you can uh, stop and take a look at that. Okay, next week we'll start off on uh, what's on our seminar part 7b, the last half of our seminar. More questions and answers. We have two weeks to try to finish everything. Um, <clears throat> Good luck. See you next week. Thank you.